Welcome everyone to our second YouTube live of this season on load holding valves, pilot operated check valves, the motion control world counterbalance valves. Glad to have you back with us. I hope you're doing well where you are. Given the, uh, the tumultuous year we've had, I hope you're well. Thanks for joining us again for our second YouTube Live of this season, our second summer doing YouTube Live broadcast. Great to have you along. Our, our next uh, live session will be September 2nd. Please mark your calendars for that or keep up with us at lunchboxsessions.com slash live. Hey, great to see that we've got participants with us this morning from, from Canada, from Pakistan, from Italy, Croatia, Chennai. We've got participant from Sweden, South Korea, Egypt, and from right close by to us in the Elk Valley in British Columbia. Welcome all of you. And participants also from India, Tanzania. So great to have all of you with us and joining us this morning. If we've got a little bit of latency with our sound and our video feed, we'll try to get that fixed up here as we're going. We're still just moving through the introduction, so please be patient with that. Wow, as uh, Mark's going to be joining me this morning to, uh, to help with some of our live hydraulic testing and uh, in our conversations yesterday, we were just thinking about the, the level of gratitude that we feel towards all of you out there, technicians, uh, engineers, system designers, problem solvers of all kinds, and how willing so many of you are to share your experiences with us, and, and it's just so great how we continue our learning all together. Uh, I don't know how you feel about it. We certainly feel that hydraulics continues to humble us as, as the dynamics of fluid under pressure and fluid when it flows and the various influences that hit hydraulic systems still provide continuous stream of challenges, and it would seem that the the learning never stops. So great that, uh, that so many of you are willing to share and uh, wish we had more time for even some of the exchanges and problem solving that we would do together. Enjoy the conversations with you. Only so much time, of course, in, uh, in a day, in a week to, to participate in those, but really do enjoy them. Another word with a, with a capital letter G that's very important is gravity, and gravity has been most reliable and very consistent, even if other aspects or others in your life of recent have let you down. Uh, gravity has been there for us, uh, even in the face of some recent rocket launches, which you may have, have uh, seen in the news. Gravity has been a consistent friend, or, or maybe foe, but uh, gravity has certainly been there, and it has continuous challenges for us, and gravity is going to factor in today as we're looking at valves that help us hold a load safely suspended for a period of time, a load that we need to lift up for only a few seconds. Hey, but we could probably get that done with some type of directional valve that has blocked A and B work ports. But if we're going to suspend a load for a few moments, a few hours, in the case of a crane, maybe even a few days, then we need something quite a bit more solid, and so we're going to have a look at valves that help us with that, and then we're going to have a look also at the types of valves that help us lower a lifted, a gravity-influenced load and lower it safely back down and smoothly, smoothly being very important, and that's where those counterbalance valves will enter in. Let's have a word now about safety, and, uh, you know, just so that you know, um, the time that we have together today, the, the types of demonstrations and the types of valve adjustments we're going to do are very much contained to a, a learning laboratory environment here. And the time we have today won't be enough to give you all of the knowledge necessary if you're doing some of these same procedures yourself. So if your experience 
and, um, and your training is limited, please work with a professional and have them mentor you. Um, if you're seeing the graphic on the screen, yeah, definitely keep in mind that, that making adjustments to a counterbalance valve or a pilot-operated check valve, if a load has been lifted up above its ground resting position, that is uh, something extremely dangerous and not to do. Many of these types of valves we'll discuss today are best adjusted and set up on a bench-type environment uh, in a test uh, bench of some sort and then placed on the machine. Please be very careful with machinery and hydraulics when your load is raised above the resting position. All right. Yes, feel free to log in to your YouTube account, into your Google surface, uh, services, and then you will be able to chat with us and ask questions. And uh, yeah, great to hear where you're from. So thank you for that. We've got new participants joining us now from Kosovo. Welcome from Vietnam, far away. That may be my good friend Dan at Sun Hydraulics who's chiming in, visiting over in Vietnam. We've got participants from Oman, from Australia. So great to have all of you with us here today in the live broadcast. You're definitely welcome to chat and ask questions during our live broadcast. We'll try to catch up to them, probably in little groups and batches. And uh, other ways to reach us if you have uh, a longer message for us, info at lunchboxsessions.com will work for your email. Or look for me on LinkedIn, Carl Dyke. I'm always willing to, uh, to, to link up with you there and exchange information if we can. A shout out this morning to Fluid Power World, your resource for components and for design and engineering knowledge. Fluid Power World is our, is our partner for the series of this season and the Fluid Power Technology Conference continues with excellent virtual events. Keep an eye on the events tab at Fluid Power World dot com our major sponsor today is Sun Hydraulics since 1970 Sun Hydraulics has been the world's leading manufacturer of high-performance screw-in hydraulic cartridge valves Sun features over 900 multi-configurable pressure flow directional control and specialty function valve products in their current catalog in addition to manifolds and accessories. The fastest way to go from concept to solution is now also the easiest with Sun's browser-based quick design with Smart Connect design tools. Achieve complete success with your hydraulic system design utilizing the products and know-how from the people at Sun Hydraulics. All right, additional participants have joined us this morning from Sri Lanka, from Denmark, Romania. Welcome to you. All right, as we usually do, we start off with some pictures from our travels out in the field, out in heavy industry. And so let's have a look at how some of the valves we're speaking of here this morning get applied out in the field. I think I took this first photo at a museum in Sweden a number of years ago. You could imagine which manufacturer I was visiting. You'll figure that out. And here we have an excavator backhoe and we're showing those stabilizing outriggers. And what is that in gold there that is bolted up against the yellow post of the outrigger? Well, I think a lot of you know that by the time you get the machine stabilized and those outriggers have been pushed down against the ground and have lifted the machine up a little bit to give additional stability, we want those outriggers to hold rock solid. And it's pretty tough to beat pilot-operated check valves, sometimes referred to as a load lock. Pretty tough to beat that for a dead locked solid cylinder positioning. So oftentimes what you will see in a scenario where the cylinder does not have to travel fast, there isn't a particular requirement for it to travel smoothly, and a pilot operated check valve can quite often be the ultimate in locking in 
tight. And so that's what you're seeing there. And, and we're going to be running a simulation similar to this one briefly. But here you see already the schematic symbol for a pilot-operated check valve in the top right corner of the screen. So you see the A and B work ports connected to tank and, and then you see those cross over dashed lines there in the upper right hand corner and those dashed lines head towards the seat of a symbol for a check valve and you know not a great symbol either the ANSI symbol or the ISO symbol you know I think probably what what maybe gets in the way for the uninitiated is sometimes they're wondering when will flow of oil happen on those dashed lines and what's so important to remember is that those are pressure bump lines those diagonal crossover pilot lines and believe it or not they actually dead end inside a little piston that helps lift the ball off the seat and the symbol just really doesn't do that justice if you look in the graphics down towards the bottom of the cylinder in the lower left of the screen then you see a depiction of what a pilot operated check valve might actually be and here you see a spring whose job it is to try and push the ball back towards the seat and so you would figure oil will never leave the bottom of that cylinder but if we come along with pilot pressure on that thin blue line we find out that we've got a piston a piston with a fairly substantial surface area that can actually push the ball off the seat and allow unnatural direction of flow. So that piston, if it pushes down, you have to uh, imagine in your mind, if you will, that that is what is at the end of that diagonal pilot lines. I'm back up in the right-hand corner of the screen again. That's what's there to push the ball off the seat. And so you see what I mean? The symbol really doesn't do that justice. It is the standard symbol, but a bunch of things to hold in your mind about what's really there. And so that is the story a uh, little bit about the pilot operated check valve and we'll come back and talk more about the directional valve that is often used with it as well but feel free to note already what happens in the center position most often when in use uh, with a pilot operated check valve that the a and b work port end up connected to tank in the center position not an uncommon scenario now sometimes of course pilot operated check valves are not directly at the cylinder if the if it's a, a plant or a mill production line and the, the valve stacks are at a safe distance from the cylinders and things are behind guarding then perhaps the pilot operated check valves will show up in the valve stack as shown in this scenario so if you're looking at my photograph there in the middle of the valve stack maybe I'll try to zoom in just a little bit for a moment you will see again the symbol for pilot operated check valves there to hold a cylinder well locked in place but at a distance from the cylinder what will happen if the hose bursts at the hydraulic cylinder and there's a distance of that hose back to the valve stack you could take a guess maybe that'll be one of our pop quiz questions but I think you know the answer so there's an example of that now we switch over to this photograph very heavy application from a paper machine in the paper mill industry and what is there at the back end of this cylinder well there's a force at work pushing this cylinder in towards retraction as a paper roll is lowered down and now we're not into a pilot operated check valve anymore we're into a type of valve that yes can do load holding is nearly as 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 effective as a solid pilot operated check valve probably in in normal usage no one will know the difference but now has the dynamics also of being able to deal with a runaway effect of gravity based load and smooth out the motion of that cylinder and so there's an application for a counterbalance valve here's the the symbol for this particular model that was in use on that machine and what you notice about the symbol 
of course, in this case, is the infinite positioning bars above and below, which lets us know that this valve, as oil leaves the base of that cylinder, as being pushed in by the, by the paper reel that is pivoting over a pin, and it's pushing the, the rod and piston back into the cylinder, and we're controlling the rate of that drop by, by placing a counterbalance valve, a motion control valve in series, and this valve can move back and forth anywhere. Modulate, that's a word that's going to come up again during our, our live session today. Here's a pilot passage from the opposing rod end cylinder line that's helping to drive that type of counterbalance valve. So more on that as we go. Let's see here. Okay, here's another typical schematic from our travels. Long vertically oriented cylinders rod up in this particular case. And how you can see how the, how the draftsperson for the hydraulic schematic has placed counterbalance valves at the bottom, the base end of the cylinders. And as those cylinders are lowered down, then you see a, a typical counterbalance valve symbol which will modulate. Yes, that's the word. It's not a matter of just being open or closed and will very carefully meter the oil leaving the base of the cylinder based on pressure information. And some of that pressure information actually a critical bit of pressure information comes from the rod end, that long dash line, that pilot. And that's something we're going to get into here during our session and try to explain the, uh, there's a bit of a dance going on, if you will. Uh, some very fine interaction that we'll struggle to understand and hopefully succeed at understanding by the time we're done. All right, down pressure. Yes, it's probably not very often that you talk about the rod end when you're lowering something down as having a down pressure. But if a counterbalance valve is at the base, perhaps that is a useful term. Here's probably an application we can all relate to. Um, a mobile elevated work platform, a boom lift, and, and certainly with, with humans in the, in the work platform at the top, lowering that boom back down needs to happen smoothly. What's there at the base of that cylinder? Well, perhaps not as easy to see in this photo, but just past this hose and fitting, you can see the a cartridge, the, the tip of a cartridge just sticking out typical application for a counterbalance valve to smooth out the lowering of that boom and make sure it's done without frightening the operators, without creating a dangerous uncontrolled drop, an application for a counterbalance valve. Here's another one. This one maybe is a little bit unusual. This one is showing up on a double acting ram, although in this particular case there is still an annulus. It's a double acting and you can see a counterbalance valve there at what you might think is the base, but remember on a haul truck in the mine most of these cylinders are mounted rod down and the connection for both the base end of the cylinder up at the top and the rod end connection all happen at the mounting point down below there and there is a tube that runs up through the center of the rod to deliver fluid to the base. So perhaps not familiar to everyone, but here it is. There is a counterbalance valve mounted and in this case it's not a counterbalance valve controlling the lowering. The lowering for a haul truck box is usually not too complicated because the box, the tray as some call it, is often already empty. But when raising and dumping the load, there can be a moment of over center action where the load may start to tip. Some of the load may be back of the pivot point. Some call that the dovetail at the back of the, of the body of the haul truck. And so a counterbalance valve can be handy in the very last few degrees of tipping the load out of a mining haul truck. So there's a counterbalance valve application as well. Moving back into the plant environment for just a moment, here's an application where you can see the counterbalance valve, but it's not mounted at the cylinder. It's not touching the cylinder. It's nowhere near the cylinder. It's back in the valve stack. You'll notice it over on the left. And yes, counterbalance valves do get used with proportional valves. Perhaps we don't see Perhaps we don't see the counterbalance valve showing off its best when, the, uh, when a servo or a counterbalance 
uh, sorry, a servo or a proportional directional valve are only slightly open for very slow flow. But if that directional valve opens to a wide setting for high speed, as is required for part of the machine cycle, then the counterbalance valve will be hard at work. And in this case, we're looking at an application mounted rod down, and the mass wants to pull the rod out of the cylinder. And that turns out to be one of the dynamic, not the most dynamic type of load to handle, but it certainly does bring about some interesting dynamics. All right, let's just see where we are here in my pictures, and then we'll stop and start to look at chat questions. Here we are in a paper mill, and we'll look at another application like this in the moment after the... Uh, after the roll has been wound and it needs to be lowered down and rolled out to the warehouse for packaging, a very heavy load. And you see the counterbalance valve mounted there right near the rod end of the cylinder, ready to help and provide that control over what otherwise could be a, a rather jerky motion and some strange things can happen. Counterbalance valve, hard at work. Here's one last example, perhaps, uh, from a, again, from a paper mill type of environment. Again, a similar type of carriage that releases. You can see the pivot pin there in the background. And the whole works rotates over center. And so now we've got two counterbalance valves, one for each direction. And they have to be set differently, because in one direction, we're tipping out a paper roll, very heavy, and in the other direction, that carriage is coming back empty and it's not so heavy, but it still swings over center. If you've heard of counterbalance valves referred to as over center valves, that is another name for them, most certainly, tied to the type of application. Here's a photograph marker I took right off the side of the machine where the technician had already written some hand notes on there saying set to the highest pressure and then 30% higher, some notes to themselves. We're going to talk about that. That 30% is an interesting one. He wrote the word counterbalance valve underneath there. How do you do that setting work? How do you know what that pressure is, right? So that is one of the things we'll try and address. Another example of dual counterbalance valves already mounted in a manifold block, each one with a separate pressure valve. What's left? Uh-oh. What type of symbol is that at the base end of those cylinders? Perhaps that's, uh, is, is that a counterbalance valve? Is that a pilot operated chuck valve? Do you know that symbol? Maybe I just threw that in for fun. Maybe we'll make that one of our, uh, maybe we'll make that into one of our pop quiz uh, mystery questions too, if you could think of what that is. That's an unusual one there. I'll just leave it up on screen for a moment. Maybe that's neither a PO check nor a, a counterbalance valve, but ends up mounted in a very similar place. Mark and I come and go from the oil field quite a bit in a type of machine known as an injector for pushing solid tubing, coiled solid tubing down into the well for servicing and then pulling it back up again requires that traction machine that you see on the right there with the hydraulic motors and the vertically mounted tracks. Do counterbalance valves get used with hydraulic motors? Yes, they do. It's a little tricky. That application isn't always the easiest one to apply counterbalance valves to, but they can help a little bit with braking, with slowing down. And generally not there to help you lock the load in place. Generally you still get disc brakes involved with that. But the counterbalance valves can help a little bit with the runaway effect and, and give you a bit of a braking action as you slow down the, um, the push or pull of that tubing. So you see them there. Quite often the ratio though for those valves, the pilot ratio is quite high, 10 to 1. That's one of the pilot ratios. If you've heard of pilot ratios, we'll discuss that a little bit more. There they are. If you could see them on the model of the injector there, the injector machine, you could see it there where the red and, and green hoses are. And the black hoses just behind it crossing over are the pilot connections. Right, so that's a good look there. Here's one last look at a track motor type of application like you would see on an excavator, perhaps. And when an excavator travels up a hill and goes over the top and goes down the hill, the last thing the operator wants to find out is that his, his machine is running a little bit ahead of the speed he intended. And so what you see there at the bottom of the screen, just above the A and B couplers there in the middle, 
looks a lot like a directional valve symbol, but it is actually a counterbalance valve. Some of those symbols on those track motors are sometimes the most confusing to look at or the most unconventional, but their job, again, is to be there to help prevent a runaway activity for a hydraulic motor. All right, welcome additional participants who've joined us from Algeria, from Haidak, Russia. Welcome this morning. Friends from Tunisia, friends from Estonia. So we went north and south and all over Europe there. Fantastic. And North Africa as well. Great. So let's have a look here. Maybe we've got a question or two already that would be worth having a look at. Samer asked, I've used this idea of a pilot, open, a pilot counterbalance valve in an open loop motor circuit to prevent running, overrunning by the low, right? But in the other direction, I always got the motor jerking and it caused vibration in the system. Yeah, and the pilot ratio was one to three, or maybe you meant, um, maybe you meant three to one. But yeah, I understand. Quite often, three to one is a tricky one to work with in hydraulic motors. You may need to do more testing to figure out whether three to one will work. A lot of motor applications, in our experience, end up being 10 to 1. Can't say exactly what your circumstances are, but yeah, motors can be challenging, sure enough. Matt has got a question or a statement, maybe a question. Is that a zero leak poppet style counterbalance valve symbol? Um, yeah, okay, zero leakage, interesting. Well, zero leakage, I guess, is dependent on some very high quality machining, is, um, is dependent on understanding the pressures that remain near the valve and its pilot surfaces when a lifted load has been brought to rest and the manufacturers of course of counterbalance valves are under pressure oh I think that was a, a pun in there somewhere but um, they're on they're certainly under pressure to design well and try to get those valves to be as close to the definition of perfect zero leakage as possible I don't think too many of the manufacturers can compete in that space without proving that that those valves will hold um, if set correctly, okay, and this is part of the formula. The valves have to be set correctly uh, as per the manufacturer's best instructions. You should be able to achieve zero leakage. And yes, so the symbols we were showing you are for zero leakage uh, counterbalance valves. All right, what are the probable causes of pressure drop in a hydraulic power pack while operating a hydraulic cylinder? Well, Deepak, that's a massive uh, amount of uh, topic there for us to get into, but um, I'm not sure we'll have uh, an opportunity to address that one today. I might need some more background on, on what the issue is with that. If it involves counterbalance valves, or load holding of some sort, let us know. Otherwise, feel free to drop us a note with a little bit more detail about that, that, um, that scenario that you're speaking of there. I'm not sure what all the details would be there. Okay. Hey, welcome participants from Panama down south in Central America, jumping across the ocean to Ukraine and up on into Texas. Welcome uh, to our live this morning. Great to have you with us. All right, let me just check my notes here and get myself on schedule here. On, um, on lunchbox sessions, you'll be able to interact with us a little bit. We've got some simulations uh, set free for you to use for today, so feel free to play along and find the counterbalance valve session on lunchbox sessions. And so, uh, let's see here. Oh, okay, our pop quiz question. I wanted to throw that out, our official pop quiz question, before we get too far into the content for today, will be, you know, you've seen a bunch of symbols now for counterbalance valves, and I think you've probably noticed that the typical counterbalance valve has three ports to it, but maybe you've seen other schematics. And maybe a valid question to ask is, can a standard direct acting relief valve, you know, the type of relief valve that just has two ports, an in and an out, a standard pressure relief valve. Could that be used as a counterbalance valve right near a cylinder? Could that work? Okay, that'll be our pop quiz question, and maybe hold that in your mind as we discuss a number of other issues related to the counterbalance valve. 
All right, uh, for those of you who'd like a, a bit of a, a metaphor here for what a counterbalance valve is all about, because sometimes it doesn't hurt to go back and think about what is a counterbalance or why is it even needed. And so I'm going to throw at you here a little bit of elevator logic, we're calling that in lunchbox sessions, and the idea that if we're in a tall office tower, a tall building of some sort that has the, the lifting works, the draw works, up in a machine room on the roof of the office tower, that it will be a little bit tricky for the motor to start and stop the elevator car as it's being lowered in the elevator shaft. Oh, and in this case, we've got, a we've got an elevator powered by a hydraulic motor. That's fantastic. Quite often, it's an electric motor, but we've got to talk about hydraulics. So we'll say it's a hydraulic motor-driven elevator draw works. And I think what you'll see there is that without a counterweight, it could be a little tricky for that, that winch on the roof of the building to slow down and stop that elevator car if there is not a counterweight and maybe a little bit tough for that hydraulic system to begin lifting it and maybe a little tough even for us to hold it fixed in place and keep the brake on when we arrive at the floor. Yes, our passenger in the elevator is looking a little bit alarmed, right? No counterweight. But if we switch over to a slightly different model here, something much more realistic, if you've seen inside the elevator shaft of a tall building, usually you will see a giant slab of, of concrete riding up and down inside the elevator shaft just beside the elevator car, and that is acting as a counterweight. Okay, This is not a perfect analogy or a perfect metaphor for hydraulic counterbalance valves, but it should be helpful in understanding that with that counterweight there, it will certainly be easier to stop that elevator car as it's being lowered. It will certainly be easier to stop and hold for a period of time. And perhaps one could argue, maybe not so perfectly here, that it perhaps helps to, to start moving the elevator uh, car upward again. Is this a perfect analogy or metaphor to what happens in the world of the counterbalance valve? Not, not perfectly so, but it gives you a sort of a sense of the job being performed, right? All right, let's move to a simulation that you're welcome to try with us this morning. Um, actually, no, not, probably not this one. This one I'll work by myself, and then we'll have some others from the counterbalance valve department session in Lunchbox that you can uh, work with me. But just uh, one from the uh, open and closed center hydraulic systems just to get us started. And maybe one that is similar to um, an image that I showed earlier. You know, here we are in a scenario where we've got vertically uh, influenced loads, gravity influenced loads, right? Oh, now what type of directional valve are we working with here? Only a, a four port two position, so not much there. Well, if we work with a closed center valve, now we have directional control as desired, but the question begs to be answered with those A and B work ports in the cutaway there and the lands of the spool covering them up. Will that be enough to keep that load suspended for a long period of time, or will we find out that a spool inside of a cylindrical valve cavity may have some leakage and our load drops down over time. So perhaps we'd be better off moving to a float center directional valve. Keep an eye on the symbol. Watch the machining of the valve spool for a second and notice, hey, hey, wait a minute. Our load crashed right down. Okay, so the float center valve where A and B ports are connected to tank, that doesn't seem to want to hold anything up at all. In fact, that makes sense that the load crash down, the word float is in there, but if we, stall, if we install pilot operated checks, and now we've got a scenario that can certainly keep us held. So now we're moving back again to a slightly simpler concept for a moment, moving from counterbalance valve back to something simpler, just to grasp some basic things about load holding and about what the scenario looks like when you're unlocking a pilot operated check valve and one of the things I wanted to draw to your attention is that float center directional valve 
with the A and B work ports connected to tank as you see it in the green circle there. That is a very po uh, popular combination for both pilot operated check valves and for counterbalance valves. And why, you might ask, is that the important one? Well, let's think again about that, about that pilot operated check valve at the bottom of the cylinder. And perhaps I'll zoom in here a little bit, make it larger for you. What we're going to notice is that if we're going to hold that cylinder locked in place, we need that spring to be able to push the check valve ball back to the seat. And the check valve ball needs to push the pilot poppet and piston, sorry, the pilot piston back to where it originated. And in order to achieve that, we need to be able to expel a very small amount of fluid from the pilot head inside that pilot operated check valve. We need to get rid of that if that pilot piston is going to travel back to the rest position. And so the float center valve, the directional valve, guarantees, let's follow it up here to the B work port, guarantees that our, our pilot line will be vented to tank. It's really not about a flow volume. The, uh, the volume of oil we're exchanging here is half of a medicine cup, a quarter, it's a very small amount. It's not so much about any volume or flow on those pilot lines, but is very much about making sure that the pressure and that small amount of fluid that did the piloting has been vented away, and the same applies to counterbalance valves in most cases. Okay, so just making an argument for making sure that pilot lines get vented down when we plan to hold a load, whether it's a PO check or a counterbalance valve, and, and why that float center valve, A and B work ports, is so commonly connected to tank. Hey, I've got a pilot operated check valve here on my desk, and let's just have a look at a little bit of a close up. I think you can see the symbol here quite nicely. Uh, this particular pilot operated check valve, Mark and I got that from someone who removed it. It was mounted right against a cylinder. So it was going to be a great, probably from a forklift or some type of machine, it was going to be a great safety device as well. The O-ring's gone missing, but this was mounted right against the hydraulic cylinder. And that way, if the hose burst from uh, the cylinder in general back to the directional valve, this would lock in place. There's the symbol. You could see the check valve symbol. You could see the dashed line for the pilot. And as I mentioned to you, that dashed line just does not do justice to the fact that that dashed line is actually pushing on this piston and lifting the ball off the seat. In fact, let's have a look at the rest of the check valve assembly that was loaded in there. We had a um, we have our cylinder port, we have our oil coming in, let's say if we were lifting our cylinder, oil coming back out if we were, uh, if our cylinder was descending, well how would the oil get back out of that check valve when you can clearly see the check valve is hard at work in there, oil enters the drilling below the seal, exit the drilling above the seal, pushing the check valve out of the way, but not back the other way, if it was only a check valve, not back the other way unless we got some pilot pressure acting on this extra port. It's a little bit smaller if you can see inside that port okay. There's a smaller orifice in there because we're not talking about moving any volume. We're just talking about pressure punching. That's a very small amount of volume and we just need the amount necessary to push and lift that ball, push the ball off the seat against the spring and allow oil to exit I'll do it the same way as when I started. Exit the drilling above the seal and, and go around to the bottom under the seal and leave the, the uh, pilot operate check valve back to the directional valve. And the piston, uh, the pilot signal came in from underneath. By the way, look at the surface areas. This is going to become a very important topic. Three to one was already mentioned today and that is the case here too. The surface area on the bottom of the piston is three times the surface area exposed inside the ball style check valve. That gives some leverage to that pilot piston. And man, oh man, is that important. You know, if you have a, a hydraulic cylinder with, say, a two to one surface area on both sides of the, 
uh, from the blind side of the piston to the rod side and you only had a, a one and a half to one or a one to one pilot operated check valve, you may end up locked. On the other hand, if you have a two to one surface area difference to your hydraulic cylinder piston with the rod hanging down and some load induced pressure, then you may find that you need a pilot operated check valve with a ratio that is higher, three to one, overcoming some of the effects that may easily otherwise get locked into a cylinder with a two to one surface ratio. So yeah, these ratios and pilot surface areas are going to become very important as we move along here through our discussion. All right, some questions have been coming in, so let me see here. Oh, quite a few. I better catch up with a few of you guys. I'll try to do a few, and we'll see where we, where we end up. Let's see here. Honda 97 says, Pressure can be used as counterbalance, but lowered on a certain weight or pressure. Not uh, perfect, though. Yeah, you may be, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but we'll run a demonstration in a simulation. We'll run a demonstration on our training unit behind me here in a moment that may be related to that. There are um, uh, sort of ad hoc versions of counterbalance valve that can work, but perhaps not in all circumstances. Yeah. Oh, okay. Ah, I see. Some of those answers are meant, are aimed at our pop quiz questions. Okay, we'll come back to some of those later. Valentin says, Carl, what if these counterbalance valves will be mounted on the hydraulic station five meters from the cylinder? Well, yeah, we showed some examples of that kind of thing, or I showed examples of pilot operated check valves, but the counterbalance valves as well. We looked at one schematic like that where the counterbalance valve was mounted on the valve stack at a distance away from the cylinders. That does happen. What uh, are the challenges with that? Well, the hose capacitance, if it's not solid steel tubing, the hose capacitance, its ability to act a little bit like a, uh, an accumulator, can still create some sponginess and some strange motion aspects. And what else should we say about that? And yes, hose burst, you mentioned that. If the hose bursts at the hydraulic cylinder and the PO check or the counterbalance valve are at a distance back at the stack, it provides you no protection from the load crashing down. Good point. Hey, Dan Fernandez, my good friend at Sun Hydraulics. We've had a few uh, back and forth Zoom meetings in the last little while to clarify. Gave me lots of tips. Dan is saying, do you see many counterbalance valves screwed directly into the cylinder bore? Um, well, yeah, I showed one example of it, but we don't see that many, no. Um, I guess a couple of examples I did show during our slides, one in a paper mill environment, it was manifold bolted to the blind end of some real handling cylinder, so there it was directly on the cylinder. I showed that one mining haul truck example, but um, in our travels, what would I say? And, and some maybe are on fittings right close by and some, uh, some nipples and, and valve adapters. Yeah, and Mark was just mentioning that um, the cost of machining the cylinder to include a counterbalance valve perhaps scares some away. To put that manifold mount there, to mill that cavity right in there, things get expensive, usually pretty cheap to just mount the counterbalance valve somewhere close by and connect tubing or hoses, but right, then we don't have that protection from the crash down. Yeah, fair enough, good question. Um, what about counterbalance system? of top drives, which is used in oil and gas. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly, Elam, uh, what, uh, uh, what you're referring to there, but certainly lots of applications out there in the oil and gas world with hydraulic cylinders on, the, um, on a drilling derrick, trying to control lowering speed, especially if there's no resistance against pushing that uh, drill string down. You bet. Sure, counterbalance valves, I think, get deployed there. Sammy from Tunisia, welcome, sir. He is asking, can we use it for both counterbalance valve and brake valve? Yes, and if yes, what will be the adjustment according to the maximum load? Whew, this gets interesting, Sammy. Um, you're into the very fine points now of how the counterbalance valve might get adjusted and which pilot ratio you might choose if you are hoping for a bit of a, 
a bit of an eased braking of a hydraulic cylinder versus a, a hard stop. So yes, it can be used for both counterbalance valves, can help provide a, a fluid brake, if you will, a slowing down as opposed to a hard closure. And maybe we'll try and catch up a little bit more on that topic later on during the live. Yeah. And Sammy's also asking how to proceed with the readjustment of a counterbalance valve on site if someone has touched it. Oh boy, yeah, been there. We've been there a few times. And um, if they've touched it, if they've made some adjustments, especially for a maritime crane, yes, very scary. Um, maritime cranes with large booms lifted up. This is not an environment where one wants to make any kind of adjustment to load holding or motion control counterbalance valves in a live environment, the, the cost of, a, of any type of error or mistake will be too great. If the, if the boom can be lowered safely down once again by some means carefully, then that counterbalance valve needs to go back to a test cavity, a test stand, a test bench environment and set once again. And we'll talk about setup procedures as we go here uh, during our live broadcast and think about how that gets done in a, in a test bench type of environment. But of course, the parameters of the machine must be known. So, you know, and Mark and I travel, what we find out so often is so much troubleshooting work and readjustment work goes well when we know all of our normal values and that it's been documented and that we know what those settings are and and how to achieve them once again if someone takes the system out of um, proper adjustment for you. We'll do some live adjustments on our vertically mounted rod down cylinder, but, but there will be no um, damage done if we drop a 100 pound weight inside of a cage. Um, you know, the, there's no risk of any damage there, but cranes are certainly a, a, an environment where one has to proceed with a lot of caution. Good point. All right, and I'll come back to a few more of those questions as we go. Thank you very much. Uh, hang on for a few more minutes, and we'll try to get those. So let's switch over to a simulation that you can play along with us on if you are in lunchbox sessions. I'll just go back out of the session, uh, back out of the simulation for a moment. This is what the session looks like, counterbalance valves, down past the videos, and we are into counterbalance versus pilot operated check valve. Little simulation there. Uh-oh, looks like we've got no ability to hold that cylinder at the moment. Let's put a lot of bricks in there and make it heavy. And let's retract. And that float center valve that we were discussing already, that's pretty crazy. Uh, no control over anything there. Our cylinder just likes to drop. Let's put in a pilot operated check valve so we can at least lock that cylinder in place part, part way up or all the way up as we might choose to do. And now we've got that check valve. A check valve only has two positions, right? Check valve doesn't modulate. Check valve does wide open and slam shut. It's a two-state mechanism, doesn't give you many choices. And so if we remove all of our bricks here, let's see, we'll remove all of our load and we'll extend, you know, maybe, maybe our flow, you know, it's a little bit interrupted. There's something funny happening there, but um, it's not too bad. If I put all the bricks back in the stack there and we lift a very heavy load and I put that cylinder into extend and oh no, we've got some very unsteady motions that happened there. If you were watching the cylinder position over time there, that was a very unsteady, I don't think anybody would say that that was motion control. That was motion out of control. That's what that was. And yeah, so great for load holding, very bad for motion control if we're going to move fluid in a hurry. And can you understand why that's happening? And so here's the reason I wanted to show you earlier what was on that dashed line, that there was actually a piston in there so that we take it into account as well as we possibly can, because when that, 
when that negative load, engineers often speak of a load on a rod down cylinder that wants to pull the rod right out of the cylinder barrel. They'll speak of that as a negative load, right? It's not the cylinder that is going to do work on the load. It's the load that's going to do work on the cylinder if gravity gets its way. And it does as soon as that valve is open, as soon as that check valve is open. And so what happens to pressure up at the top of that cylinder on the blind end port of that cylinder? That pressure that was so important for piloting the ball off the seat, drops down to such a low level, vacuum possibly, and now what does the check valve do? Check valve does what it likes to do, slams closed. When there's no pilot pressure present, that check valve does what it naturally wants to do, slams closed. And as soon as it slams closed once, and motion stops, pressure builds up in the cylinder once again, Pressure builds up at the top of the cylinder. Pressure builds up on that pilot line. The check valve ball is pushed off the seat, and it opens once again, only to find the load trying to pull the rod and piston out of the cylinder faster than the supply of oil arriving from the pump and directional valve. Yes, into a cavitation moment, into very low pressure, probably a level of partial vacuum, and the check valve slams shut. So. Not great. Now, somebody mentioned earlier that maybe we could sort of hack a bit of a counterbalance valve together. What if we put a restriction orifice? We've got a needle valve there. Can you see what I'm adjusting? Have a look at that needle valve there, and I'm just going to tighten up on that needle valve. And what's that needle valve going to do? That needle valve is going to induce a back pressure in the rod and port as oil starts to flow. As you know, an orifice in a hydraulic line does nothing dynamic. Pressures equalize on both sides if we're in a static condition as we are now. Pascal's law takes over, right? But if we go into extend and oil starts to flow through that orifice, that orifice now becomes a pressure drop and, and gives us back pressure back into the rod side of the cylinder, which transfers pressure to the top end of the piston there, the blind side, and that is maintaining pressure all the way along in the feed line of our hydraulics, and most importantly, pressure down that pilot line where that little piston is I was showing you on the small camera earlier, and it's keeping that check valve off the seat, right? But is that a good way to go, right? What is the issue for the cylinder if we over-tighten that flow control? If we really pinch down hard on that flow control and the cylinder is not doing work, so therefore the cylinder does not produce a pressure drop, but instead, what does it do? And if some of you have guessed, quite correct, that the pressure is actually intensified from the blind side of the cylinder to the rod side. Right? It's a pressure increase. And so that can get very scary. That can get a little dangerous. And we can actually find out that the pressure there at the rod end port might be so high due to the differential of surface area on a single rod cylinder's piston. There's a differential in surface area. And it will multiply the back end pressure over to the rod side by the ratio. And then maybe even add some more pressure from that negative load hanging down we could end up with pressure so high that you crack your cylinder barrel, that you perhaps blow a hydraulic hose off. Not good. And there's no relief valve there if, if between the cylinder and that needle valve to bail you out. The system relief valve has no knowledge of what's going on there close to the cylinder. We've created a cylinder, a single rod cylinder intensification moment. And so this is not a perfect scenario. Does it get used? Yes, but under systems and designs where all the parameters are known and never going to change at all, then this can be used. If there's going to be any dynamism at all to the system, different loads, applications, scenarios, this can lead to a lot of trouble. But it does work. Hey, we should demonstrate this now on the training uh, panel for you so that you can see it. You know, we've got... We've got our load suspended. You know, you're going to hear us speaking about load-induced pressures here. And so we've got our 100-pound steel brick lifted off the ground. 
It's being lifted by a cylinder that's behind our panel of counterbalance valves. But there it is. It's a rod down cylinder. And right now you can see that our static hold pressure on the rod end of this cylinder is about 200 PSI. And um, yeah, that's, you know, that's just our 100 pounds of steel divided by about a 0.48 square inch surface area on the annular side of the piston in that cylinder back there. And so that's approximately 200 PSI, just a little bit more. So that pressure gauge is reading quite, quite accurately. And so we're just going to give you a bit of a demo with a pilot-operated check valve now. First, here's the pilot-operated check valve. There it is. We've got oil leaving the rod end, and we're passing it through a flow control, but we haven't tightened that flow control. And then we've got it passing into port number one, which is the inlet to the pilot-operated check valve if we're leaving the cylinder. Port number two is on its way back to the directional valve. And port three, that's our pilot port. Port three is coming from this T-fitting here. We're using the down pressure. So one of these hoses, this one, is feeding flow from the directional valve to produce flow into the cylinder for extend and dropping our mass. And the other hose, that one's being used as the pressure bump on port three. It's the pressure bump that's going to operate the little piston that never really shows up well on the this, on this symbol. Nothing we can do about that. Let's just see how smooth that action turns out to be when we go to lower. Okay, there was nothing smooth about that. Maybe we'll just raise and do a little bit more just to give you the full. Okay, very unsmooth and very jerky. But perhaps if we're very confident that this system is never going to see any variance, Mark's going to tune a little bit. But keep in mind, we're now inducing a back pressure against the rod side of the cylinder, but we're able to lower it smoothly. But we better be confident about what's happening with the cylinder, with all operational parameters and make sure that there's no possible way of intensifying, that the machine will always be used the same. And there's just really no guarantee that that's ever going to be a consistent, smooth operating system. So Carl, here's, here's what I am doing. It may not be obvious to the people watching, is that I, when I made that first adjustment, I turned it one complete turn, which then took that jerkiness out. So I've, I've been backing off. You can see that every once in a while we get something happen. So that's not quite enough to, to take that jerking motion out. So then when I, when I just give it a little bit of a turn in, it's not very much, then I'll get that smooth action. I just turned it maybe an eighth of a turn. And now I've got a smooth turn. So it's a very fine adjustment once you get into the range uh, your flow control doing some work and of course then I want to I want to observe the pressures that are on the rod end so I'm watching this as I come down I see the pressure raising up that's normal then when I go down I'm looking to see what range of pressure I'm in here and you had mentioned about pressure intensification and what what can happen if I over adjust this this is where the problem comes in. So if, as, as I turn this up, if you keep an eye on the pressures now on the extend cycle when the weight is being lowered, you're going to see that I can adjust that by what I turn my hand here. And that's where the danger of pressure intensification comes in that we have to be very mindful of, have to understand it totally, because if I were to get to a point of over adjusting this, then what will happen, if I close this right off, you'll see that pressure actually go up higher to the point where I have exceeded the pressure. Let me make sure I get the right button here. Now I'm up high. We've got our pump preset so that we're in control of the pressure intensification. We know the ratio that we're working with. So 
So when you look at the, the blind end of the cylinder, our pump setting of 600 PSI, any blocked off port, the intensification brings that pressure up to uh, just, just about 1100, 1050, 1100, which is a multiplication of the ratio of the cylinder as well. Mark, that's twice our system regulated maximum, correct? Yes. Yeah, it's almost twice the maximum of our system at the moment and the system gauges never know about this. This is stuff you find out as you're connected right up at the cylinder. Sure, we could achieve smooth motion and perhaps in this scenario, but if the temperature of the fluid changes, if other things change about the load, and perhaps our ability to use this trick doesn't work, and perhaps we end up with some dangerous intensification. All right, great. Thanks for Good. showing us that. Um, probably the last thing for us to point out as is found on some machines where perhaps there will need to be an emergency lowering of the boom if, if the ability to operate the hydraulics is lost and that this particular pilot operated check valve if we wind that screw clockwise we're not adjusting anything about it what we are doing is punching or overriding the ball off the seat and if we had hydraulics no longer running you could turn that screw inward and actually release the load without having to have a running hydraulic system. Right. So now I'm taking it, I've, I've adjusted it where I can feel the screw touch the ball. You can see that I'm just barely lowering that or I can increase it and lower it faster. This is very important to understand if you have this option on your valve in the event a man is up in a basket, gets injured, electrocuted, whatever, he can't control anything, you can get him down whether you have power or not. Follow the machine manufacturer's directions on how to safely do that. That gets but very please, involved. But please, never forget if you've done that to back it back off so that it's not touching the ball because if the next time the man goes up in the basket, he's going to fall right down again. Okay. He's mechanically had it there off. There you go. That's PO check valves. That's as far as we're going to go on that topic. And from here, we'll switch over to the wonderful world of a counterbalance valve. All right, great, let's see. We've got some questions coming in there. Let's see, Prince uh, Singy says, if flow control valve is fixed after the pilot line, maybe the cylinder down freely because always pressure is built up on the pilot line. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I'm understanding that. Um, flow control after the pilot line. Ah. I think what you mean is a flow control after the oil going into the top of the cylinder. Yeah, um, perhaps that could work, but that, that gets to be, um, um, there can be oscillations there. It can be difficult to, to create an application like that. The counterbalance valve will serve better. Pradeep saying pressure intensification can bend the cylinder rod. Um, let me think about that. I suppose that is a risk for a small diameter uh, rod for a very high ratio inside the cylinder. Haven't experienced that one myself, but I suppose the potential for that is there. Pradeep also asked, is a CBV and an OCV both the same? Oh, I'm not sure what OCV stands for right now. Over center valve, perhaps, Mark said. Yes, that would make some sense. I think so. Um, counterbalance valves often get re referred to as motion control valves or over center valves, and those names then have more to do with the machine configuration and application than the, um, um, than the type of product that was purchased. And certainly the setup is tricky. Yeah. Okay, let's see here. All right, in the same simulation that we're still running, let's, um, let's, let's lower this down here. How do we do that? I'm gonna extend that down, a little bit of, take the restriction of our flow line off. Let's change to counterbalance valve. So we've installed a counterbalance valve now instead of a pilot operated check valve. Oh, these ports, one, two, and three. Get used to those port numbers and where they are on the counterbalance valve because we're going to refer to those port numbers quite a bit. Port number one is oil entering the counterbalance valve as it leaves the hydraulic cylinder. You could say that's our motion control port, oil entering on number one. Number two is always on its way back to tank. 
And so those are your main flow ports, one and two. And then, of course, port three is pilot port, and that's not a flow port. You don't have gallons per minute on that port. It's just a pressure bump. We're going to have a look at some pieces of a counterbalance valve here in a moment. And we've got some great 3D we're going to show you today as well on that. The check valve is there to allow us to retract that cylinder and bypass the main modulating. Well, one might think that that's a separate poppet. One might think, oh, okay, so there's a modulating poppet in there, and then there's that check valve down below, and it's all usually packaged inside the same device, the counterbalance valve. Well, it's not necessarily two completely different uh, flow paths, but they get utilized differently, and we'll see those fine points here in a moment. But if you're watching what's happening here as we run the counterbalance valve as opposed to the pilot operated check, perhaps if we were to put a, um, uh, a microscope, a magnifying glass, on our slope line there, we might still see little moments of runaway and then recovery. But the counterbalance valve is so busy modulating as opposed to the PO check valve, which only had wide open and slam shut. The counterbalance valve is busy modulating, making the opening just a little larger, then making the opening just a little, uh, little smaller, <coughs> based on a balance that is happening between the mainspring inside the counterbalance valve, which biases the valve towards closure, cutting off that poppet arrow from ports one to two, versus the pilot pressures, of which there are two. There is an, what some would like to call the internal pilot or high pressure pilot on this dashed line wrap around that makes the counterbalance valve look like a very close relative of a relief valve. If not for the fact that there is a second pilot, the main pilot on number three, and that is usually your larger pilot, unless you bought a one-to-one, -one. Uh, but that is your larger pilot port, and there is uh, no flow on that. It's just a pressure bump. So there's two surface areas involved here, and we'll start to talk about ratios, where perhaps there's one and a half surface areas on three compared to the number, uh, just a one surface area on one. Or maybe there's 10 surface area equivalent on pilot port three versus the one surface area here on inlet port one. It'll always be a ratio of something to one. And the one, the singular surface area for piloting open will be on port number one. The many multiples of it, as in one and a half or three or five or eight, or 10, that will happen on the surface area that is associated with pilot port number three. So that's where the really big push will come from to try and get that valve to open. Okay, We're only speaking about it in very simplistic terms so far, but we want to get the used to the symbol and what's happening there and think about the modulating of the valve instead of just wide open slam shut like the PO check valve did. Let's maybe have a look at a counterbalance valve with a little bit more detail, maybe cut away. So over on the right-hand side there, uh, let's see here. Let's lower that down, and we'll see it in action. Over on the right, you can still see the schematic symbol hard at work, but now let's look inside the valve and see if we can understand what's modulating. And this is where it's going to get kind of interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to raise the load back up again. So here we are in the check valve mode, right? Right now the check valve on the symbol is open and notice that the poppet was pulled away from the main adjustment screw and stem. Otherwise, the poppet stays fixed against the adjustment screw and stem during descent, okay? So here we're gonna extend now with that runaway load. Here we are. The poppet's not moving. What? The poppet stayed fixed in place. No, it's the piston which is actually a cylindrical or a spool-shaped device. It's called the piston due to the surface area. Oh, there it is. See, there is that number three surface area. I'm going to zoom in some more now. There is that number three surface area that will always be larger by some multiple. Three to one, eight to one, ten to one. Well, where is the one that we're talking about? That one is hiding right 
there. That's where it's hiding. That may be a little hard to believe, but it's there. We're going to have a look at that in camera here in a moment. It's there, and it's exposed when the valve is closed. That surface here is exposed in what is perhaps turns out to be about half a V-notch shape, but there it is. There's that one surface area where perhaps over here on this surface area we've got three or five or eight or ten. Okay, multiples of that surface area. And so it is this piston that's all highlighting together now is, as one in green when I hover over it that is pushing up against a very heavy spring. Okay, the spring for the return action when we lift back up again. Here's us lifting our cylinder. This is the check valve action. Yes, there is one more spring, and no, it doesn't always show up on the manufacturer's own symbol. They're trying not to distract you with that. That is a very soft spring by any comparison to the main spring. This spring that may or may not show up on the manufacturer's own product symbol will turn out to be perhaps one bar, five, seven PSI, maybe maybe two bars or three bars at the most. Okay, We could talk about more of th that later if you want, but that's a fairly minor role compared to the very important role being played by the very heavy spring inside. We'll see the pieces here in just a moment. Oh, that pilot passage too. I'm going to show you that in camera and it's very small. You might have a dash for a quarter inch hose, a, a five, six millimeter hose coming in to port number three. But in the end, it passes through the cartridge body and sleeve in, um, in a tiny, tiny little opening that might be oh, 0 0.030 or 0 0.040 inches. Very small, very small. So the last thing we want to do is see anything plug that up. We, the, the manufacturers work so hard to dirt, make these valves dirt resistant, but they cannot make them dirt proof. It's, it's assumed that we're going to use a liquid and hopefully a liquid that's being maintained with as few and as small particles as possible because look here let's put a let's put a fault in there let's see where am I I'm retracted I'm going to put a a piece of debris in there do you see what happens we wedged we wedged some piece of debris in there and maybe we should cycle that rod down without the debris I'll remove that watch those pressure gauges Watch that top pressure gauge, maybe, for the most part. Let's watch that top pressure gauge. There it is at maybe 12 to 1 o'clock, flickering just a little bit. This is, can be normal if we've got a high-resolution gauge. Look at the bottom one. It's ahead maybe at 2 o'clock. These are relative values. Let's raise up again, but this time we'll throw a fault in there where we've blocked number 3, and pilot pressure can get, cannot get to that multiples pilot surface area where it's three or five times what's on port one. And now look at our pressures. Our pressures are much higher. Okay, we've essentially lost the benefit of the pilot surface area. Our pressures will be higher. Our load motion may or may not be steady. Our valve may be squealing. Our hydraulic oil will be getting warmer, especially if we're cycling often. So we've lost the benefit of leverage from the pilot surface area if that hole becomes plugged. Keep your hydraulic oil clean. Okay, I hope watching that go back and forth a number of times gives you some clarity about the action of what's happening on the inside. Maybe let's have a look at some pieces here for a moment. Oh, some questions have come in. Yeah, Sammy is asking if we use a counterbalance valve with a two-way flow control valve, the speed for the load will be controlled by the adjustment of the flow valve or the counterbalance valve. Oh, I see. Uh, of a needle valve used in series with a counterbalance valve. Sammy, um, you know, so a proportional valve essentially is a, a needle valve, right? A flow control of types. But typically then that proportional valve is on the outlet side of the counterbalance valve, not between the cylinder and the counterbalance valve where the, where the balancing of the adjustment will be interfered with. All right, uh, Pradeep asks, what happens if we connect counterbalance valve in reverse, meaning two on the cylinder side and one on the pump side? Well, um, what happens is your check valve that's built into the counterbalance valve is now in the wrong direction. And so your cylinder will lower without control, 
And then when you go to raise up the cylinder, you will have um, a very high pressure for raising because you will be working against the resistance of the counterbalance valve during raise. And essentially, Pradeep, the mistake of, of that backwards mount is that you've lost the ability to, to counterbalance, you know. Um, so, yeah, be very careful with the orientation there. But check the manufacturer's exact data and specifications for the model you've got. Uh, I don't think too many uh, valve manufacturers now um, use the port numbering differently. Um, there have been times in past when um, there have been times in mo most most all the cartridge makers out there refer to the the nose of the valve as port number one. But we have bumped into some older records where all of a sudden the manufacturer then jumps up high on the valve and starts numbering from there. So two and three and four. I think most of the manufacturers that used to do that realized that that was disturbing a standard that's f reasonably consistent now. And so one is here at the nose and then your first side port number two and three and four and five and so on as you go up towards the external parts of the valve. But that's not to say that you don't have older valves and specific so yes, ch always check for your documentation with that as much as you can. Let's see here. MZ from uh, down in Sparwood or Elkford commented, Carl, on the uh, Komatsu 930, it's on the hoist control valve. Yeah, oh, the counterbalance valve that I showed earlier. Yeah, that counterbalance valve that was mounted inside the cylinder was not from a Komatsu truck. You're right. On the Komatsu, it's at a bit of a distance from the cylinder, and you've got hydraulic lines hoses between the, uh, the cylinder and the counterbalance valve, which uh, does change things around. You lose, perhaps, hose burst protection, but on the other hand, um, you know, there could be some other advantages to that as well. You're right. I know which... I know which uh, Hall truck model you're referring to. Mark and I are nodding our heads to each other about that. Yeah. Okay, so Easy Company tw tw 222 said, why the P port to tank, P to T, or all ports connected to tank are not used with a pilot operated check valve? Oh, I think you're referring to the directional valve. Um, well, with P to I guess that implies that you're probably using a, a fixed displacement gear pump or vein pump very likely. You're not using pressure compensated pump and you're looking for a way to unload pressure when the directional valve's at center. But um, the issue that you're running into here now is that with the A and B ports blocked off on that type of scenario with a directional valve where P connects to T at center and the A and B work ports are blocked, you're ending up with a scenario where you may not have the pilot line of your counterbalance or PO check adequately drained. And so that valve may be open a little bit. And so now you may find your boom or whatever the application is uh, drifting downward as oil tends to leak around a lot of basic directional valves. A lot of basic directional spool valves will allow leakage. And so maybe if you stand there and look at it for five or ten minutes, the boom has, has moved down. You're not load locked. So that, um, that A and B work ports connected to T is, is definitely the most popular directional valve configuration for safe usage of PO checks and counterbalance valves. Just, and that's the valve that's showing here right on screen now in the simulation at the moment. That is the, the simulation PO a directional valve there. Okay. Um, Sundra Pali is asking why drifting is happening in all major excavators, sir. How to overcome drifting and causes for drifting. Wow. Um, yeah. Gee, that's a big discussion. We, Mark and I, do get some calls on that one. It's probably a little bit out of the scope of today's topic because you'll find out that on the vast majority of excavators, there really isn't um, a counterbalance valve there. The operator is so busy active lifting the boom, reaching out with the stick, curling the bucket, digging, and what have you, that the, the bulk of the, all of the action is handled by the, by the operator moving the proportional valve. So then things become very interesting to study where is the fluid coming from that allows the, the boom lift cylinder or the bucket curl cylinder to drift when you have the operator controls in neutral. I'm not sure we'll have time, unfortunately, to, uh, to work uh, in detail on that one today. 
Valentin Shakov is asking, what is the difference between counterbalance valve and pilot-operated check valve? Yeah, the, the, the difference, and you may have heard me speaking to it a little bit, is that the pilot-operated check valve has two states, wide open, slam shut. It does not modulate. And so, if you have an overrunning load, that is a load that wants to pull that cylinder out, or push it in, for that matter, faster than what the pump can supply, fluid, the pump and directional valves can supply back to the cylinder, then what you will see is that very uneven jerky motion that we showed earlier with the PO check valve. So for a hydraulic cylinder that may have to move quickly and smoothly while having some type of overrunning load, push on the rod or pull on the rod, the counterbalance valve also known quite often as the motion control valve, smooths things out because it modulates a little bit larger, a little smaller, instead of just wide open, slam shut. All right, let's see where we are in our list of things here. Yeah, let's have a look at a typical counterbalance valve. You know, here we've got a counterbalance valve cartridge. It's almost all fully assembled except for the fact that we removed the retaining wire so we could get it apart. And if you ever take the retaining wire out or take a cartridge apart, uh, don't, don't try to ever put it back in service or reassemble. It's, it's now your learning model, which are great to have. You, you need to have some valves disassembled in a shop environment to, to learn a bit about it. And um, you know, when we look inside the, um, the body of the valve here, and we see that there is indeed a spring. Can you have a look at that spring? Look at that spring. That is a heavy spring. I'm going to push on it uh, with all my might here with my thumb and index finger with both hands. I think what you'll see is that I am not deflecting that spring at all. That is some heavy spring wire. That is among the very... Okay, I'm showing you a, a cartridge that is 5,000 PSI, 120 gallon per minute maximum flow rated. I'm going to move these other pieces out of the way so we don't confuse things. But that is a very heavy spring. And that is the spring that the pilot piston is acting against. Okay, so that surface area that we talked about that has the high amount of, of ratio. This, this particular valve is a 10 to 1. So this is 10 times as much pilot piston surface area as is the surface area on the small annulus down here at port number one. Okay, and I'm, I'm just sort of picking at it with my fingernail, and you might say, I don't see anything. Well, here, here we've got another same valve taken apart, and we've got the poppet removed. Here is the very same, the same valve, and the poppet, the retaining spring has been removed, and so I can remove it. And I think you can see, if you're looking carefully here in the camera, I'll just move it around a little bit, but I think right at the very outside before the taper begins, you can see a brighter, shiny, silver area, and that is a flat, annular space that is not taken up or covered up by the tapered poppet and seat arrangement. That is a flat pilot space. If I put it back together, there is that surface area. That is surface area on port number one. That's it. That's port number one surface area right there. Whereas down here at this end, this is 10 times the surface area on port number three. 10 to one on this valve. If it was a two to one, we'll just reduce the size of this annulus. Machine this, this area smaller so we have a smaller annulus. Okay, obviously a few other things get changed but uh, to put the valve back together, but that's it. Then we have two to one surface area or three to one, whatever that ratio might be. Okay, so this one, on this valve here, the, the spring is still intact for the, there you go, I managed to pull it open. This is what is happening with the 25 PSI spring for the check valve. As soon as I let go, that poppet is back against the stem, but you already know that that, that, that poppet stays in in general position during counterbalancing. During counterbalancing, the, the back end of that poppet stem, you can kind of see it sinking into the middle there as I'm moving it, that stays fixed against the end of the adjustment screw as the cylinder is descending in, and the cylinder is counter, the valve is counterbalancing because during that time, 
let's put the spring back on there. During that time, it's the piston now that's receiving pressure on the annulus, and it's pushing and compressing that spring, and that's what's opening our main flow path here between the piston and the poppet. The poppet actually hasn't moved. It's the piston that moved up and compressed the spring. Okay, you'll see that in our 3D. It'll be more clear in a moment. Oh, and this is a really good time just to clarify some things about the adjustment. Many counterbalance valves are moved to a lower hold value, to a lower pressure setting by turning the adjustment screw clockwise. Okay, you're going to a lower hold or a lower pressure setting by going clockwise. That is backwards for a great many other pressure valve type applications. Well, here's why. When you are adjusting that screw and you're turning it clockwise, there's a floating nut inside. I'm holding that floating nut between my, my thumb and index finger. And that floating nut is moving up and that's relaxing the compression of the spring as opposed to when you turn it counterclockwise with your Allen key, with your hex key, turn it counterclockwise, that's moving that floating nut down the adjustment stem and that's compressing the spring. And now you're moving to a higher pressure setting by going counterclockwise. So again, this is one of the reasons to be so cautious about touching this kind of valve when it's already on the machine. Probably the most common mistake is we saw some drifting, so we thought we would increase the counterbalance valve by turning it clockwise, but you already know what that did. That reduced the setting, and now the drifting problem is worse, and we probably shouldn't be touching it, as I think somebody said earlier in the live. Don't touch it if you don't know it, right? And the reason this works well is because there is this this bronze bearing washer that stays underneath the cover of the body. That's a bearing surface. This stem doesn't get any longer or shorter on this model. It stays the same length. It's this floating nut with these four ears that are keyed into slots inside the body, keyed loosely, and it floats up and down and compresses that spring as you adjust. Oh, probably one other thing we should, we definitely have to make reference to, is port three. So. Let's see if I can get enough pieces back together here, make this work for you. So port one is here on the axial port on the very end. Port two is oil heading back to your directional valve during counterbalanced action. Okay, the reverse when we're, when we're uh, just going through the return flow check operation. But that's port one and port two. Then we move higher up and I'm just hanging on to the sleeve here, but it's in this little undercut. Can you guys see this hole? Can you see it? Look how tiny this little orifice is. It's very small. And that passes through on a diagonal drilled hole to the outside of the body. And let's see, show it to you. I think my camera. Can we recover through one of our hotspots only? Okay, a little bit of interruption. Apologize for the uh, dropped moments there. I was aware of that, so I haven't raced ahead of you. Thanks for your patience. We had a little bit of difficulty there for a moment with bandwidth. So that pilot hole on number three is drilled through at an angle. It's a very small hole. So as much as you may have a, a dash four or a dash, dash six hose approaching port three for piloting, in the end, I think I put a number 60 drill bit or something in there. It's a very small little passage entering into the pilot port. So. There's some information about that. And this is probably a great time, given our little issue there, and to switch over to um, having a look at how we actually adjust this type of counterbalance valve. We have another simulation here. I'm going to switch over to.
All right, and so what we find out when we're adjusting a counterbalance valve is that one of the things we need to know is the load-induced pressure. That's an important one for us. And so you saw that earlier when I was showing you on the... Uh, when, we, when we were on, the, on our training panel, we showed you that we had a static hold pressure of 200 PSI. That's just how much load-induced pressure there was on the rod end port between the rod end side of the piston and blocked port number one in the counterbalance valve. So that's that. But then if, if we only had the valve adjusted to that exact pressure, then the slightest vibrations in the machine, the slightest bits of, of, of pressure spiking for whatever reason it might happen, and that valve would be open. So we wouldn't be load locked. Okay? So the majority of manufacturers are asking that you would set the counterbalance valve to a relief pressure. It's going, relief pressure? I thought this was a counterbalance valve. Set it to a relief pressure that is 30% higher than your static load-induced pressure, your hold pressure. So if we were at 200 PSI of load-induced pressure, then 30% higher would have us set it at 260. Well, now you scratch your head and go, how am I going to set it at 260? What does this mean to set it at 260? So if you're looking on screen here at our next simulation, which we like to refer to as the relief setting mode, all of a sudden there's no hydraulic cylinder here anymore. In fact, all the connections are kind of funny. In fact, where did our directional valve go? Well, it disappeared. And this is typically where we like to get out a hand pump to help us get things properly set. So you'll notice that pilot port number three, where all that surface area is, you'll notice that we've connected that to the tank. That's gone. Number two, we know that heads back to tank normally anyway during counterbalancing, even if through a directional valve. But now we've gone back to tank as directly as we possibly can. And we come along with a hand pump and we start to pump that with the hand pump because with the relief setting being set 30% higher than the static load, we're not looking to set this relief type of setting we're about to do. We're not, we're not needing to set that for you know, 40 gallons a minute, 100 gallons a minute. No, that is not what needs to happen for this setting. We need to have this relief setting set for its cracking pressure at 30% higher than our load-induced pressure. So here I am now hand pumping and I come along with an Allen key on that counterbalance valve and what direction am I turning it? Well, I'm turning it counterclockwise and watch that adjustment nut, that floating adjustment nut is moving down the threaded stem as I compress that super strong spring that you saw in camera a moment ago that super strong spring is being compressed a little bit and notice that we are only working with surface area number one now okay the singular surface area there that is all we are working with there now and so we are adjusting to set our counterbalance valve as though it was a two port relief valve okay we're setting it as though it was a two port relief valve and we're setting it 30 percent higher to just crack open 30% higher than what our load-induced pressure, the, the pressure of just lifting the load off the ground and finding out what is the heaviest load when we just have it suspended and adding 30% to that. And that's where we get that valve correctly adjusted to have that margin that is now past the exact moment maybe where we stopped the uh, the, the counterbalance valve from allowing a load to drift down. Okay, so that's a little bit about that. Um, some people sort of guess at it, right? Some people will stop the load from drifting. We'll demonstrate that in a moment. And then they maybe add a third a turn or a half a turn. Well, you might get close. You will need the manufacturer then to give you a chart of turns, sorry, a chart of PSI increase in relief valve mode for every turn of the screw. So you could decide how many wrench flats, how many sixths of a turn just going by the flats of the hexagonal might boost you up to that 30% over. It's a little imprecise, but you might be stuck with that one at times. And let's face it, you know, once this relief valve is correctly set in a bench environment, in a test cavity and placed in machine, I think someone mentioned earlier on in the live, you know, what happens if somebody touched it? And messed with it. This is a bad thing. Nobody should because once that relief valve is in place, or sorry, once that counterbalance valve is in place, 
that adjustment stem really should be thought of nothing other than an emergency lowering, an emergency lowering override screw, uh, similar to what Mark demonstrated earlier with, uh, with pilot operated check valves. Once it's on the machine, no one should touch it once it's correctly set. Okay, so that's the process. And the reason we're using a hand pump, right, is that we're just trying to get that valve to crack open, not go wide open. And hand pumps allow you to control with a very low rate of flow. All right, let's see where I was headed next here. Let's, um, yeah, let's have a look at... Yeah. All right. So yeah, this is the setting of a counterbalance valve. Sorry, I just found my place again. This is the setting of the counterbalance valve, and one would think that that's nice and reliable. Something to note, though, is that when this counterbalance valve gets put back into the machine, and the machine becomes active, and perhaps there are other sections of the hydraulic system that are using the same return to tank main manifold line, you know, if there's a common pipe or hose that goes back to tank in that number two port on our counterbalance valve, have a look at our number two port. If pressures start to rise on the number two port because of other activity in the hydraulic system and it's no longer zero as it will be in this hand pumped environment, if that pressure now comes up once it's installed to say 100 PSI, there's maybe 100 PSI of ambient pressure in that return to tank line. In a three to one counterbalance valve, that 100 PSI will raise up the effective relief setting by 400 PSI. 100 PSI on the tank line, on the tank return manifold, on the number two side of our counterbalance valve, will raise our effective relief setting. So we may have thought we set it to 260 and we put it back into a system that has 100 PSI always kind of present on the number two side of the valve. We've just added 400 PSI to the setting. Okay, that's for a three to one. Uh, for other valves, it'll be less or more, but it can interfere very quickly with what you thought was the correct setting. So think a lot of dynamics need to be uh, taken into account there to find out, okay? And again, that 30% margin that we raise up above the actual load-induced pressure, that 30% gives you a margin where um, minor pressure fluctuations in the system won't cause the counterbalance valve to come open, it won't start to become uh, leaky under minor pressure fluctuations. Instead, all you've got left is what the manufacturers often refer to as thermal expansion relief, meaning that if the sun is baking down on your machine and all your hoses are black and things start to heat up, pressure may continue to increase inside hydraulic oil due to thermal expansion and being set 30% over you're at a level now where only thermal expansion of the hydraulic oil may bring up the pressure to a point where the, where the relief action from port one to two may crack open and only for a split second. It's not like it's gonna go open and lower the boom. It's just going to very momentarily recap to the maximum pressure and that's the purpose of that extra 30% there. All right. What about pilot ratios? Yes, we, we keep mentioning that, and we haven't yet um, shown you that very carefully. Um, let's, uh, but let's maybe stop first and run a panel demo on the counterbalance valve action here, and let's just see what we can learn if we go to a bit of a live demo. I'll grab the roving camera and hope our bandwidth is all right. Mark is working with a, a three to one counterbalance valve. There's our symbol, port number one for oil returning from the rod side of the cylinder is there. Port number two is back to the float directional valve. Number three, number three is our pilot pressure. And so it's literally connected into the circuit the very same way in terms of ports one, two, and three as the pilot operated check valve. And you saw that in our simulation as well. So there's our symbology. Port number three is coming off the top of the symbol, but it's actually here on the right of our cavity that's in there. Port number two back to the directional valve. Port number one, oops, port number one, there it is, coming from the rod end of our rod down cylinder. All right. 
Here we go. Should, should work. It'll work. Right, it Walk us through it, Mark. Oh, is that just the float center valve in neutral, Mark? Yes, it is. I guess our counterbalance valve wasn't set correctly. It then. isn't set correctly. One of the other things you were talking before, if that load drops down, what I, what I notice in always playing with these is that I can continue to, to uh, lower the cylinder rod because the valve has itself created that stopping action where we get this delay. So it's falling faster, currently, it's falling faster than the setting. So I'm ending up with a void inside my cylinder. So what I'm looking for here, now this goes back to what you've been talking about. I want to increase the pressure to hold this load. So I do have to turn it counterclockwise in this particular valve. On this one over here, it's the opposite. Different manufacturer. So you have to know your valves really carefully to understand all the components involved. So when I try and increase this by turning it clockwise, or counterclockwise, I should say, let me raise it back up again. I'm just gonna adjust it until I see it starting to slow down. Getting it close, getting it close, and now I've reached that equilibrium point where the load-induced pressure and the ratios that we're playing with, this valve is set, but I have no idea what pressure I've set this for at this point. And this is why the need for bench testing is so imperative to make sure that you're working safely with this type of valve. So well, when I move my valve down, up and down, or my oh. cylinder, oh, see, I wasn't quite there yet. When he let go of the directional valve, there was some additional drifting. It would seem as though it was soft, the, the dropping rate. Yep, it drifts a little bit after so he shuts off So just give that a little bit valve. more. Again, one of the things I've seen people over the years make mistakes with is they try and look for the distance the screw moves up and down to maybe get it back to its original. And you had mentioned that, Carl, that due to the construction, that screw never changes uh, its length, exposed length of the thread. So you either got to count flats, count wrenches, do something to make sure you have that. So then we have a nice smooth motion. And that cylinder, see that delay disappeared? because the valve is holding back just what it needs to to make it work. So if I run it through its full stroke. No herky-jerky. No herky-jerky, yeah. That's our new term this last couple of weeks preparing. Herky-jerky. Okay, so this is a very approximate setting of a counterbalance valve in a highly controlled environment. But as Mark said, knowing what the actual pressure uh, using the relief method of setting the, it's unknown to us. All we know is that we're, we're able to hold the load. You know, we're probably close, but do we have a 30% to 50% pressure margin above the load induced pressure? We don't know that, and it, since we can't make this load any heavier, the mass is fixed, there's no way to find out. And hence, the bench testing method is most definitive where we hand pump as I showed you in that previous. Here's our load, here's our load induced static pressure around the 200 PSI value, but exactly what this valve is set to in terms of the relief setting mode is unknown to us. Okay? All right. And this is the other mistake people make when they try and adjust this. You mentioned about people who, who have played with it. Touched They'll it. watch a gauge and notice that when I if I were to turn this, you will not see these gauges uh, respond to the movement. So that's critical, mm -hmm. although in our simulation we show that the differential changes, which it does, but we, we won't see an action. So then people say, well, I should have turned it the other way. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. now we don't even know where we're at. So Very, very hard to set with uh, pressure gauges on the cylinder in the live machine. Very, very, very challenging. Not really possible to do that, nor safe. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. All right. Let's have a look at some three-dimensional movie here that we've made. Chris worked very hard to with me on a new 3D simulation. And so we'll talk a little bit about the surface area ratios here, and then we'll start wrapping this up. 
and maybe you'll have some more questions about how can one actually see these pilot ratios. What can one do to actually, if you wish to witness, you, you, you're pretty sure you have a two to one valve, a three to one valve. How can you actually have evidence of that? We'll try to bring some light to that. But here we have a, a bit of a 3D simulated movie to take you through a scenario where we're starting off with a two to one pilot ratio. And so you might observe that inside the counterbalance valve on the light blue part, which we would call the piston. There's a minimal amount of surface area there, and we would say that's twice as much surface area as what's on that small flat at the end of the piston, so two to one surface area. And while we're raising, while we're raising the cylinder up, there's not much to see except that the poppet gets pulled away from the adjustment stem, that's the only time that you're gapped there. There's a little retaining spring pulling down on the spring for the check valve function. And then we get to the top, and this is us now with our directional valve in center, a float center directional valve, and it's been centered. And so now we're just hanging on to our weightlifting equipment here. That's our mass, some dumbbells. And our annular side of the hydraulic cylinder piston is keeping a volume of oil compressed against the closed poppet, which I think you now understand that the poppet arrow one to two and the backside of the check valve function in the symbol are really the same point of closure, but we're against that closed, and so there is our load induced pressure, our static hold pressure, and there's really nothing to see here. But as we push forward, on the valve lever and go into retraction, let's just have a look at what our, our pressures will be here. Let's push forward on that valve lever and notice that our cylinder is descending nice and smoothly. Perhaps if we look inside the counterbalance valve, we'll notice that the blue piston is backing away from the face of the poppet and coming back against it. And for sure, we've over-exaggerated the motion. The total travel is likely very much exaggerated, making small movements and hopefully nice and smooth. Now, if on the other hand, we find out that our pilot pressure is too high and our system is very inefficient and we're really paying the price with high pilot pressures and high rod side pressures, we might switch to that 10 to 1 surface area that you just saw change over there. We went to a 10 to 1 surface area. Looking inside the counterbalance valve now, that annular piston surface area grew. It's much, much larger. There's 10 times as much surface now there than there is here on the end where the poppet seals against the piston. So we've got a huge pilot ratio. That's leverage, right? That's leverage. That means we don't need as much pressure on the number three side of the valve at the top of the cylinder. We don't need as much pressure to crack this valve open. And that can be just great. That's really desirable at the opening stage. But maybe once that uh, mass starts to fall, maybe because our pilot ratio is so great, maybe that valve will open so wide. Let's see if we've really got smooth control over that load as it drops. Here comes the push forward on the valve. Oh, ah, yes. It looks like we had some, some very uneven motion. Some oscillations occurred at the beginning of the descent and we didn't have smooth motion control. Perhaps 10 to 1 was not a good choice. Let's play the movie over again. I won't interrupt it this time. I won't hit the pause button. This is starts off with a 2 to 1 pilot ratio. You can have a look at the blue piston there to see the small annular and nothing to really notice about the raising. That's just our lift pressure. That's just our load induced pressure. But here we go into the drop. Nicely controlled, modulating happening. We exaggerate the motions perhaps a bit. Pilot pressure at 12 o'clock, port number one load pressure at three o'clock. These will just be relative values, okay? Let's look at those pressure gauges again though as we, as we move to a much larger surface area, okay? Much larger surface area. And so now it won't take very much pressure on port three because of all that leverage we've got from the large pilot to crack this valve open. So let's see what happens to our gauges this time. 
Yeah, our pilot three pressure when we're descending is only at nine o'clock. And our load induced pressure hardly moved off of the 12 o'clock. Oh, it oscillated back and forth a little bit though. And what we noticed is that it took a while before the valve smoothed out. The initial drop created a scenario with a pressure drop so great that the piston moved away from the poppet excessively and we had some, some uh, uneven motion, some instability as it's called. So what you may be getting a picture of now is that there is a price to be paid, right? Higher pilot ratio is more pressure efficient, more energy efficient, more heat efficient, but perhaps less stability for a load that might run away with the rod. On the other hand, a three to one or a two to one pilot ratio give us much more stability and, and control over that orifice opening in the counterbalance valve, but we pay a price now where our pilot pressures are higher, our, our, uh, our top of the cylinder pressures are higher, our annulus port one pressures are higher, and so we're paying the price with higher pressures and higher pressure drops and energy and heat in the hydraulic system. So that's our comparison there. And just to sort of show you where that all goes, let's go back to my photo album and have a look at a, let's just make this full screen now. Here is some data logging that Mark has been busy doing over the last few weeks as we were getting ready for this and we reconfigured our, our, our lab equipment numerous times to try and get you know, as ideal a response as we could. We worked hard to get our port two return to tank pressures down as low as possible during operation. And so it ended up that through the very small counterbalance valves we use on our sort of half gallon a minute to one and a half gallon per minute system, that our port two pressure, we got that down to about 26 PSI on this right hand, yeah, about both of them. The blue line there, that was our return to tank pressure, which interferes with your official setting, raises your official relief valve setting of your, of your counterbalance valve. So we got our tank two pressures down pretty low, and then the magenta, the violet colored line, that is our pilot pressure, so that's port three. And then the really important one is what was the pressure like between the rod end of the cylinder and the opening of the counterbalance valve on port one. That's the green line. So as we brought pilot pressure up on the one and a half to one, our pilot pressure came up above, you know, about 115 PSI and opened our valve and there was just a very small pressure oscillation which might be a, just a very brief moment of instability, okay, in the lowering down of our cylinder. Just to make clear what we're starting off with here, this green a horizontal shelf at about 200 psi. That's us just holding up our load static, that 200 pound brick. Uh, it's just us holding our, the, our, one and our, sorry, our 100 pound steel brick divided by about a 0.48 square inch annular piston surface area. That's just us holding the load and then pushing forward on the valve lever to descend and let the counterbalance valve jump into action. So our port one pressure went from the static hold of 200 up to about 350. So our pressures to lower uh, on, on the rod end of that cylinder, even though gravity's pulling it down, actually rise up. The counterbalance valve has to produce a pressure drop to control it, but how high do you want that, right? But we've got pretty good stability with a minor little pressure oscillation. The rest of the descent of the cylinder runs pretty smoothly somewhere around 350 psi. And that's us working with a one and a half to one surface area ratio counterbalance valve. Over on the right hand side is a 10 to one. Here, let me squeeze these two graphs together a little bit more now that you know what we looked at on the left. I'll pull the 10 to one valve in a little tighter. So again, we started off the same. 200 PSI, that's just us suspending the load, just letting the system settle for a moment before Mark pushed forward on the directional valve handle. Well, notice two things. Notice, number one, that our pilot pressure wasn't 115 PSI anymore. It was down closer to 80 PSI. So lower pilot pressure, but also lower port one pressure, leaving the rod end of the cylinder right, somewhere around 200 and uh, 310 now, as opposed to before when it was closer to 350. 
But uh oh, what's this back here at the beginning of the descent of our hydraulic cylinder? That is that instability. That is what you just saw in the 3D movie as at the beginning of the descent, a bit of overshoot, undershoot before a balance started to occur. That moment when you let that weight free fall into gravity, there is that moment of uncontrolled acceleration of that mass before the balancing act between the pilot pressure and the port one pressure balance out against each other on the spring and the oscillation dies down and we've got smooth control. So these pressure spikes back here at the beginning showing instability meaning not great motion control. The 10 to 1 pilot area ratio not a good choice for that particular application and just a demonstration of that. All right, that's, that's, that's a lot of information for our short time together. Can't possibly cover off on all of the dynamics that happen in the world of, of load controlling, motion controlling. Uh, concrete pumping trucks with an articulating boom with many sections. Do you know that carpenter's ruler that folds out in many sections like a Swiss Army knife? Wow, if you watch those concrete pumping trucks set up on site, those types of booms with many articulating sections which begin pushing one way and then by the time they're extending out are over center. Very dynamic environment to try and make all of the best possible calculations for a counterbalance valve. We've shown you a system that only had a straight vertical down and we could see there was already a little bit of dynamics there. Journeyman asked, if you are lifting a heavy mass with booms and cylinders, and you are lowering that with double counterbalance valves. Is there a risk of cylinder overrunning due to weight of that mass? And how to ensure it doesn't overrun? Can a numeric value of some sort, ratio, pressure, something, be found somehow to make sure no overrunning happens? By overrunning, I mean a situation where motion just doesn't stop when you try to stop it with a directional valve. Yes, there is methodology to that, and it takes some studying and some instrumentation and you'll need a design engineer involved with you. Um, if, um, if that's not expertise with your particular group, consult with the, uh, with, the, with the manufacturers of the counterbalance valves and they will work with you to develop procedures to test and get the best possible settings for what sounds like a very dynamic environment. Um, there, there is a process to get to the answers. Matt is asking, are you not able to set by monitoring pilot pressure and going off the pilot ratio. Um, yeah, not really, no. That's, um, that's a pretty hard thing to do. The pilot port gives you leverage. What you really want to find out is whether you've got load holding capability. So that was that relief setting mode with, with port 3 uh, vented to the tank and then adding 30% to that and then going back to connecting up your pilot and seeing if you have stable motion in short. Pretty hard to do by just measuring off of the pilot port pressures. <coughs> uh, Pradeep asking, does the setting of the counterbalance valve change depending on flow? Um, it shouldn't. Um, you know, all poppets when they open have, have some degree of curvature. They're, you know, rarely are they perfectly linear, but it shouldn't set, uh, it shouldn't shift radically, no. If the, if the valve is sized correctly. It's very important in, in counterbalance valve selection to never oversize the valve. This is probably a good time to mention that. Typically, counterbalance valves are selected slightly undersized. It's a little different criteria than what you use to choose a lot of other type of cartridges or hydraulic valves. You tend to go a little undersized as opposed to being just right-sized or oversized. In a hydraulic gen, okay, Zaid is asking in a hydraulic generator application, how do you select the ratio of a counterbalance valve? Hmm, I'm not sure. I, I haven't come across counterbalance valves per se in a generator. I would probably need some more information on that application. If it's a hydraulic motor, though, hydraulic motors turning a generator set is probably what you're referring to. Then quite often those are at the higher pilot ratios like 10 to 1, because you're just looking for some soft braking and some generalized uh, prevention of overrunning and not wanting to stop on a dime, which can be terribly hard on a, on a rotating shaft. 
Uh, Ravindra asking, if counterbalance valve is in continuous operation, then how much heat is generated in the system? Heat is generated by, by continuously cycling oil through a counterbalance valve and counterbalance valve action. Yes, how to avoid it. Um, carefully select the lowest pilot ratio that still gives you good motion stability. And if that still isn't good enough, then look with uh, the manufacturers like Sun who now have uh, load adaptive type of, of counterbalance valves that, that actually um, change the pilot ratio depending on what phase the cylinder action is in, whether it's just cracking open, whether it's already moving. Um, or look at their load matching, which can sort of self-adjust at the same time, and perhaps some additional energy savings and therefore heat savings can be had by switching to those types of models. Pradeep asks, which one is good? Counterbalance valve or check Q meter? I'm not quite sure what you mean, but if you mean pilot-operated check valve, perhaps Pradeep versus counterbalance valve. Depends on the application, right? If you need to move a cylinder quickly and there is an overhanging or overrunning load and or there is dynamic, especially if there's dynamic aspects, there's changing aspects to that overrunning load, then counterbalance valve will be far your best choice. All right, we're coming down to the end here. There's lots more materials that you can learn from on lunchbox sessions. So feel free to explore those possibilities and sample the free uh, information that's available there. We have our lesson that is busy being updated. We'll also produce in the coming weeks and months some more videos based around the 3D model. There's lots of other good things we hope to be able to show from that fairly soon. The products and services, the system and the artwork here at CD Industrial Group and Lunchbox Sessions are brought to you by the hardworking team of Nathan Crystal, Robin, Chris, Ivan, Alex, Keelan, Mark, Lenore, and Owen. And thanks to our, our partner for the series this summer, Fluid Power World, and of course our major sponsor, Sun Hydraulics. Remember that our next YouTube Live is September 2. Our topic will be the electronics of hydraulics, that meaning the, uh, the controls, circuitry, and the sensors. I love, I love electronics, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Join us for that one. And we thank you, the participants, for being with us today. As far as our pop quiz question was concerned, let's do that one now, dead last, before I sign off. The pop quiz question, if I remember, was can you just put a, a basic direct acting two-port relief valve in as a counterbalance valve and forget about all this pilot wonderfulness? Let's see who said here. Some are saying, no, you could not use it as a counterbalance valve. Matt says, I guess the problem is that you would have maybe some inconsistencies. Honda 97 had thought about that too and thought it would not be a perfect scenario. Yeah, it's, a, it's going to be an energy waster. That is the beauty of having the leverage from port 3, the pilot port. You could put a relief valve in line with oil leaving the rod end port in, in the application that we showed the most. Most certainly you could and you'd need a check valve, of course, to pass back through the other way but your pressures would be so high and there is no guarantee that there would be a really good consistency of motion lowering. But there was a time we've seen, we come across some schematics in our own visits, uh, systems that are perhaps 30 years old or more where a basic relief valve was used in line as a counterbalance valve, but the price paid is energy and heating and not so perfect motion control and that's not great for the age we're in now where we're trying to be as energy conscious as possible and of course have your hydraulics running as smoothly as possible really appreciate you guys being with us for today thanks for being patient with our bandwidth hiccups there and hope to see you again on september 2 this is carl from lunchbox sessions signing off thanks for being with us <laughs>